be celebrating his 65th birthday. You never know it when he's playing racquetball. He hogs the front center court. <laughs> he makes impossible shots. It's very difficult to win against uh, Pat. Pat was born in Chicago. He attended the University of Maryland, was in the Army in Vietnam and Korea. He was in the Army five plus years. He's married to Karen. He has two children. He moved to Washington because Karen's best friend moved here. So that proves the uh, French saying, Sur la femme, you know, follow the woman. <laughs> uh, works with John Anderson at Beacock Business Resources. Uh, his hobbies include motorcycling, fast cars, uh, must have a lot of testosterone. <laughs> and he's the past president of Toastmasters, and he's also uh, further up in the organization. Uh, Alexis could tell you about his other honors in Toastmasters. He's involved in a military honor group uh, called the American Veterans Honor Guard. So it's a great deal, a pleasure for me to introduce Pat. I particularly like his book. I had brought my copy and I was showing him. Mine cost 50 cents. That was, that was the book price. So you know how much I've had this when I'm reading it. Now the question is, did you buy that one new? I did. You did. <laughs> so you had it a few days then. Yes. And it says on the back that I could have got a hard copy, hardcover copy for two dollars and ninety-five cents. All right. I wonder if we sit in for that today and they still honor it. <laughs> have to make a copy of it. Well, I do see that some of you have brought your copy of the book. How many have read this book at some time or another? Well, that's good. That's a good. And how many have read it recently? Say within the past year. We got a few there. That's very good. Okay. And then the next question is, of course, how many of you are actually doing the book? <laughs> See that? That's great. You're doing it. So Think and Grow Rich is a concept, a timeless concepts that are put together back in 1937, and actually when Napoleon Hill began putting this book together was around 1908. And over the ensuing years, when it was published in 1937, he interviewed over 500 successful people and found out what exactly they did that created that success. So over the years from 1937, there have been many revisions and publications of the book. One that I use is called the Think and Grow Rich Action Pack. And some of you are familiar with that version of it. So it has not only all of the principles in there of what he's talking about, but it has this action pack that talks about how to actually do this. To do it, to make it work. That's the thing that we want, is our success from it. So how do one go about doing that, making it a reality? Thoughts are things. And Napoleon Hill talks about these thoughts in the first chapter. And what he does is he uses stories to convey his points. And the stories are about people that used these thoughts in some manner that created a difference for them, that created Something that fed to their success. Think and grow rich. So he talks about, as you go through this book, when you get what it is that's being put out here, that you should stop for a moment and turn down the glass. So what does that mean? that you're going to have an aha moment 
when, as I've read this book and listened to it, I've had many aha moments. So I've turned down quite a few glasses. And it's brought this information out in such a manner that you get what it is. But you have to listen to it. You have to read it and digest it and get it internalized. And once you have it internalized, then it starts becoming you. And that's the key to it, to make it you. The thoughts that you have are who you are. So those thoughts can either be good thoughts, they can be bad thoughts. You can, though, control those thoughts. And you are the only one that does have control over those thoughts. I was thinking about this one time when I was in the army. They indoctrinated us in a lot of different ways. One of those ways was that if you were ever captured and made a POW, that all you were supposed to give was your name, rank, and serial number, right? Hmm. Well, a lot of people were captured during wars. And a lot of things happened during that time. And some people didn't give more information than their name, rank, and serial number, and some did. But what made the difference? <clears throat> the difference was what they thought. It had to do with their thoughts. That's all they had control over, was what they thought. And again, I remember when I went through this indoctrination period in the Army, they told us this. And then, when I was in Vietnam, I was an infantry soldier, and I was out in the field. And as I always thought about that. Now, what would happen if I ever got caught? And what would I do? How would I respond to that? Now, I didn't know anything about Think and Grow Rich back in those days. But I did have it in my mind that if anything, any situation arose that it appeared that I was going to be captured, I was not going to give more information. But be, on that, I decided, I made a decision in my mind that I would never submit to being captured, that I would die first. And as I've thought about that over the years, I've wondered sometimes, would, that, would I have really done that? Or maybe not. But the mindset, as I've related it to this book now, that mindset is what makes the difference. And we all have the power of that mindset. It's a choice. Right? In chapters 1 through 3, they talk about <clears throat> desire, faith, and the concept of auto-suggestion. You're probably, most of you are familiar what's called auto-suggestion. Okay. So when you look at desire as the first <coughs> step to attaining something, if a person doesn't have desire, they're not going to do much of anything. But the stronger that desire is, the more they are capable of within themselves. Faith. Faith is the most important element because faith feeds desire. And desire feeds faith. But not in and of itself. 
Because desire will only feed faith if there's action behind it. Faith, desire, and action. Action feeds faith. It can either increase faith or decrease faith. Depending on what you believe to be true. The faith then feeds the desire. Again, that can put you in an upward spiral or a downward spiral. Depending on how and what you believe. So it comes down to that belief. Once the desire is there, and you develop that, you have to have some sort of knowledge into it. Specialized knowledge is what Napoleon Hill calls that element that you add into what you're doing to create something with that. So specialized knowledge, imagination, and of course, with all of that information, one must be organized. That's one of the biggest challenges I have, and something that I've been working on quite extensively, <coughs> is to develop within what I do a good structure of organization. Without an organized plan of action, you're just in a state of chaos for the most part. And chaos isn't going to get you where you want to go. Now it may get you someplace, and it may accomplish some things given enough energy and enough motion into it, but will it accomplish what you want efficiently? Probably not. But putting those together the specialized knowledge, the imagination, along with the organized planning, creates the framework for what you're doing to be moved ahead or moved back, depending on what your purpose is there and how efficiently you do it. <coughs> Chapters 7 through 10 talk about the power of decision. Persistence, the power of the mastermind, so important. And something that a lot of people don't quite understand is the power of sexual transmutation. How does that work? The mastermind is a powerful entity all of its own. Creating interaction with a person or multiple people that you either have a group or you have a one-on-one, -on -one, but with somebody that you trust and somebody that can help hold you and you help hold them accountable for what you want. That's the power of a mastermind group. You can do it on your own, maybe. But again, these principles over this time has been found to be accurate. And again, what Napoleon Hill does in the book is some of the stories. Particularly, there's a story about Henry Ford that talks about how Henry Ford had on his desk a row of buttons that if he pushed any particular one would summon to his aid a person with specialized knowledge and information to help him in some area of what he was attempting to do. So he had that available to him. Now we all can have this available to us, and especially in a group like this. 
there are people in this group that can help each other. And as a larger group, we can all help each other, which we do. The challenge that I would put to each of us here is that we utilize that more. That we take the time to know who our friends are here and how we can help each other get where we would like to be. It can be very powerful, very powerful. The mastery of sexual transmutation. What is that? There's energy. Sex energy is something that a lot of people will shy away from. They'll look at it as kind of a taboo, something not to be talked about in a group or to be discussed. But there's a lot of power in sexual energy when it's guided in the right way. And when it's put to work for you in a manner that creates good energy and in a manner that helps you interact with people in positive ways. That's what he's talking about with that. And again, this is something that takes a while to really understand. Now I have audio of all of the chapters in the book and I've listened to this over the past probably five to six months I have probably listened to the all of the audio on this book no less than a hundred times and probably more and at times I've sat and listened to the audio and gone through the book as I'm listening word for word and read it and use all the senses I can to get this information out of here and into here to make that process move along as much as it possibly can. Where I don't understand something at first, I find that after 15 or 20 times of listening to it, it starts to make a little bit of sense. And after that hundred times or so, now it's starting to really come out. And I find myself now thinking about it in a manner that, yes, I might be driving down the street and suddenly a thought will pop into my mind on something in here, and it'll clarify it. <clears throat> now, what Napoleon says is when that comes to you that you should stop and turn down the glass. Well, if I'm driving, I don't do that usually, but I wait until I get somewhere else. But I remember those times, and I've had many of those, and I'm sure that those of you that have really gotten into this have had those moments also. Have more of them. Because those moments are going to increase something in you. The subconscious mind, the brain, and the sixth sense. We can look at the subconscious mind as kind of the software that runs the computer. Not the application, but the operating system at the core level. Because it's there. You don't really see it, but yet it's the thing that's doing the actual work of making things do what they're doing. Did you ever find yourself doing something that you thought, I, I really don't want to do, it's not something I want to do, but yet you do it? Or you find yourself saying something that, where did that come from? These things come from the subconscious. We are the sum of whatever our experience have been. We've all had different experiences that have brought us to this room here today 
and the sum total of all of that experience, some of it's good, some of it's not so good. And it's sifting through and taking those good parts of it and then being able to look at those areas that aren't so good and deal with those in a positive way. But all of that comes through that subconscious. So how do we control that subconscious? And this is one of the key things in this book. All of these chapters interact with each other as you move along through this. So just talking about it in a lineal manner is one thing, but it's dynamic and it all interacts. Dealing with the subconscious takes us back to the chapter on auto-suggestion and developing for yourself that information that's going to get through the filter and into the subconscious that's going to create the environment to get you where you want to go. And that's powerful. Having not just the goals that you want to accomplish and all of that mission information that you want to strive for, but other information as well. Information that tells your brain and tells your subconscious what you really want. And in this, it tells you exactly, precisely, how to develop that. And what to do with it as you develop it. So I have from this the information that I put together that I go through every morning and every evening and some of it throughout the course of the day. And as you do that and become habitual with that, it changes you. It causes you to be whatever it is that you're telling yourself that it, you want. <clears throat> the last part of this has to do with the most important. The last chapter. The six ghosts of fear. Now again, when I was in the army, they taught us to be fearless. And fear has a good place. Because fear can keep you alive in situations. And fear can give you information that says, be cautious. But what else can fear do? Fear can paralyze you. Fear can cause you to not move and not do what you want. So fear is a double-edged sword, isn't it? However, you can use fear to your advantage. If you first identify what your fears are. Now they may be something big, or they may be just something small. It matters not. The element is to identify it, what it is. Now I'm going to make an assumption. If we're not where we would like to be, then there must be something that's either holding us back or keeping us from, in some manner, not doing the things that we want to do in order to create the success for our lives that we want. Where does that come from? Those things can be lying in the subconscious someplace, down there where you don't notice it, you don't see it, and may not even recognize what it could be. So doing a real thorough evaluation of yourself and really looking at it and saying, what could I be afraid of? What may I have a fear of in some way, shape, or form? 
There's six basic fears that he talks about here. One of those is the fear of poverty. Criticism. Now I found that the fear of criticism was probably the most prominent thing that I had a challenge with. I grew up in an environment that was very critical. So what's going to happen? You're going to have some kind of response to criticism that's not going to be particularly healthy for you if you want to succeed because as a business owner, we face rejection and criticism constantly, don't we? It's part of business, it's part of life, it's part of being out there. So how does one deal with things like that? Right? The fear of ill health. The loss of love. Old age and of course the biggie, but it's still number six on the list is the fear of death. And the way Napoleon Hill talks about these is that all other fears that are out there fall into one of these categories. And you can identify it in that way. So you've got these six major places and then everything else underneath that. But doing an evaluation of yourself, and if you're really gutsy about it, you might get a friend and have them help you with it. And I'm sure you could find someone even in this room that would be willing to do that. But to help you with it, to say, I'd like to take a look at this, and I'd like to see how you see me in this kind of a situation under this microscope here. And be willing to listen to what someone has to say about a particular element or a particular area that you might consider that you have some fear there. And that information can help you grow in a real positive way. So I've done this myself a couple of times with some people, and I found it to be very powerful. Because when you look at it, and you, if you can sit with somebody and just listen to them and ask them to be very honest and that you want to do this with somebody that you can trust will be candid with you. And somebody that's not going to just say, oh, you're just a nice guy or you, you have this all together here. You want honest feedback so you can do something with it. And that makes all the difference because unless you deal with those fears, whatever it might be, the rest of the principles in the book are not going to get where you want to go. So then a real key to this is read the last chapter first. Get into that last chapter. <laughs> Because when you get into that last chapter and then go back to the front and start over again, it puts a whole different perspective on it. Think and grow rich. And as you think, as you develop the thoughts, and you start working on all of these, it's going to make a difference. It's going to make a huge difference. But it's a workbook. It's a Bible. I have a few copies of this. I have one that I keep now just as a reminder to me that that was the first one that I read. And I started this in 1994. I read it once or twice. And then I thought I had done it. And then come along a few years ago and realize there was a lot more to it than just reading it. So now I keep this all the time. It's always with me. I have the audio on my phone. And whenever I'm in the car, 
I plugged that audio in. I listened to some part of it. And without you know, doubt, every time I listen to it, I get some little additional nugget out of listening to that that I didn't get before. Or it brings something together, some part of the concepts that I already know and have had, it brings it together a little more. So to think and grow rich, do it. Do the think and grow rich. Does anyone have questions? Yes. That absolutely begs the question. You've been a student of that, serious student of that book. It means a lot to you. So how has it helped you? It's helped me tremendously. I could not be standing here right now without having done a lot of this. I, could, I wouldn't be able to do it. Can you describe that? What, what is it that you're talking the about? The fear, my biggest fear has been the fear of being criticized. I grew up with it. It was always, somebody else was always able to do something better. And if I didn't do something right the first time, it was wrong. And it was not just wrong, but it was punishable wrong. So growing up with that and having that ingrained creates an environment. So all of this on the subconscious level then, how does that operate? Right? Talking to someone, doing sales, what is sales? Sales is 90% rejection, right? So out there talking to somebody, what do you do? So most of the time it was try to find somebody that's not going to reject, but not doing this on a conscious level. This is not conscious. So then, what are you doing? You're not talking to very many people, right? That's what the, that's what happens. You don't talk to very many people. And then, you start creating this other talk that says, oh, that person is going to say this or that, so I better not talk to them. Well, how do I know what they're going to say? I'm judging them then. And that's one of the worst things you can do. Because you're judging only by looking at someone, not even by the conversation that never took place. Right? Dealing with that, then, has been my biggest challenge. So I've gotten to a place where, at this point, it doesn't matter what they say doesn't matter whether you agree or you don't agree. It, that's not the important thing. The important thing is to have that interaction and allow the person you're interacting with to be whoever they are with whatever challenges they have and whatever they're doing, and you be who you are with your challenges and be whoever you are in that place. And be conscious of the fact that that does exist back there. And one of the things that I've really looked at with this is that whatever it is, is so much, and that's what's controlling now. And how do you get rid of that? Well, you don't really get rid of it, because it's there. Once it's in there, it's in there. But the thing you're doing is you're making the other so much bigger that this becomes now insignificant in relationship to what you really want, which is where the faith and the desire and, most of all, the action, because without the action, you stay in where you were. With the action, now you have the opportunity to cause that to change, and then self-evaluation. So there's a cycle that you go through. 
Yeah. Patrick, as you know, I'm a student and a teacher of this book, yes. so I, uh, I teach a group on this. But two things I would offer. One is I post every day on a group called 30 Day Challenge, Think and Grow Rich 30 Day Challenge, mm -hmm. on Facebook, part of the book. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get a little snippet of it every day, it's a great way to get it. The other thing is that download that you have for the audio, I have a link to that. Mm -hmm. It's welcome to have that. Yeah. And third, the, the most important thing I know about this book is that every personal development person who's out in the field today, no matter who it is, this book happens to have all the quotes in it, all of them attribute this book to what they're doing. Yes. This is the masterpiece, this is the holy grail of personal development in the modern age. It's the history of Andrew Carnegie coming forward and saying, I was the richest man in the world at the turn of the century. And he passed that on to Napoleon Hill from 1908 to 1927 when he finished the book Then the Great Depression hit. And something happened during those seven or eight years to Hill where he finally finished the book and published it in 1936, 1937. So it's a wonderful holy grail to look at it that way. It's kind of hard to read. It's a great study. Yeah. Read a little bit of it every day. I do. Yeah. It's a great way to keep moving. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Okay. I do have a handout for you here. And the site for downloading those files are on here as well. So you might take one of these. And with that, oh, go ahead. Here. I just have one quick uh, mm -hmm. thought here. If you read a lot of the modern books on success, a lot of them talk about techniques of manipulation and other superficial uh, processes. Mm -hmm. Where when you go back to a book like this, he talks to he gets right to the grain of you know how you think, uh, how it how it affects you mm -hmm. and how that and how that affects your daily life. And that's the real reason for going back to this yeah. is because you get the basic truths, not just a bunch of superficial manipulations yeah. and things like that. Yeah. And that Napoleon Hill had contact with these people. Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Andrew Carnegie, all of these people. He had physical contact with them and got this information firsthand. Think, Andrew Rich. Very good.